It is Thursday, and that means it's time for Caroline Heldman, professor of critical theory and social justice at Occidental College. She's here to break down the week's political headlines, and there are many. Good morning, Caroline. Good morning, Giselle. Hopefully the start of a great day. Oh, we should like it to be. Not so in Ukraine, as you know. Uh, their president, Vladimir Zelensky, in a very inspiring and impassioned speech before the U.S. Congress, he again pleaded with the Biden administration and those lawmakers to enact that no-fly zone, to do more. Before we get into the dynamics of that, put Zelensky into historical perspective for us. He's been, you know, compared to Churchill. Absolutely, and for good reason. This is a man who is essentially the Stephen Colbert of Ukraine. He was the voice of Paddington Bear, the series of films in Ukraine. Uh, this is a man who rose to political power, playing a leader who was cleaning up corruption in a TV show. He then formed a political party named after that TV show and was indeed elected with 73% of the vote. So very popular, kind of like our Donald Trump, right, rising on his, his media star to the presidency. Um, uh, in the days since, the 22 days since uh, Putin has violently attacked this nation, uh, Zelensky has established himself as a fearless and courageous leader, uh, one who fits very closely with his TV character, but who knew that this was his actual person. And he's really grown into the role. And I think an important message we can take from this is that he is reframing leadership. It's not just strong men who are effective. He's been incredibly effective in both branding himself and rising rising as a hero in, the, in history books moving forward at the same time that Putin has become a global pariah. Right. And it's resonating. Even here at home, I saw signs, yellow and, and blue signs on people's lawns saying we stand with Ukraine. So President Biden addressed the nation after Zelensky spoke. He committed $800 million, as you know, in more aid, but nothing on the no-fly zone. So here's the question. Is there a chance that impassioned speech moved lawmakers to actually cross that line, or you say no chance? No chance, because a no-fly zone would mean World War III. Uh, let me just explain quickly. A no-fly zone means that you are patrolling the perimeter of that zone, and you're also willing to shoot down planes. Putin would very clearly see this as an act of war, and it suddenly wouldn't be Putin in Ukraine. It would be Putin against NATO, Putin against the U.S., Putin against the EU. It would be World War III, and no one wants that. All right. President Biden called Putin a war criminal for the first time, ratcheting up his speech. A fierce change in tone. What does that tell you? Well, it tells me that Biden's looking at the same Im images that we're all looking at that have been verified. It is remarkable to see the power of media and social media in this war immediately showing us that Putin is attacking civilian locations, for example, and civilian uh, evacuation corridors. Uh, Biden, I think, also understands that anytime you're in a, in a conflict, um, it's not just a war on the ground. It's also a war of framing and messaging. And he is very clearly framing Putin as a villain, making Making it more difficult for countries that want to align with him at the same time that he is uh, helping to solidify the opposition to Putin. And Caroline, I have to ask you about Vladimir Putin's speech yesterday. He went on this really bizarre rant, lashing out at Russians, he said, with Western mentality, calling them like bugs that fly into your mouth that need to be spitted out. They're traitors. Is this a sign of desperation or determination? Ah, that's a great question. I mean, he is a very bitter, isolated man right now. Nothing is going his way. This is not what he anticipated. And also, it's pretty clear that Russia is no longer a military superpower. So this is a man, you know, who knows what he does next. And I know we're focused specifically on the Ukraine conflict right now. Um, but once this is resolved, whether it's, it's quickly or in a matter of years, what he does next is a, a really big question mark, given um, his ego, given his ideas about leadership, and given his brutality against his own people and people in other countries he has invaded or assisted in invasions. Right. And Zelensky seemed to indicate, which I thought was a shift in tone as well, that he understood joining NATO was not a reality, his words. If he agreed, Caroline, never to join NATO, except the annexation of Crimea and the Donbass region, is that the kind of sacrifice or compromise that would end this, or does that just give the aggressor entree into a wider war in the future? 
Ah, great question, Giselle. It's such, those would be huge concessions, right? Zelensky would be giving up about a third of his country, and he would be agreeing to not join NATO. Um, I do think his shift in tone uh, is a way to signal that that's at least on the table for negotiations. So there's two big ways out of this, right? One is that, that um, negotiations work, and those, what you just laid out, uh, ends this conflict, and uh, Putin and Russia withdraw. Uh, the other, which is more likely, uh, is that we get into a protracted war, that Putin keeps pushing and eventually captures Kyiv, and then the United States, the EU, and NATO provide support to freedom fighters who push against that occupation, uh, and it, it becomes a longer conflict. And this is something, by the way, that Biden has been signaling. He's been talking about how we may be in this for a while. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it would, those would be incredible concessions, and there is no assurance that Putin would actually end the war, even if he got what he is asking for. And complicating matters on the world stage is potentially China's engagement in this war, supporting Russia and Putin by buying up high-priced oil to underwrite what's going on. How does this change the stakes there for us here at home? Well, it changes the stakes, certainly for us, and it changes the stakes globally. What, the, what is happening right now is a geopolitical realignment where countries are having being sorted into pro-Putin, pro-Russia, or against, right? It's either you're with us or against us. And China's in a really tough position because while they are major trading partners, partners with Russia, uh, the EU and the U.S. are bigger markets. So they need to make a choice here. And you see uh, Ping, Zhe Jinping is stepping back, right? And he is saying, um, I'm not as supportive as I was initially, uh, but I would anticipate that China's going to use backroom deals in order order to get financial and military support to Russia um, while possibly distancing themselves. And of course, um, President Biden and Xi are going to be speaking um, tomorrow, I believe. So we'll see what comes out of that meeting. So many dynamics playing out on the world stage and all of them frightening. Caroline Heldman, as always, thank you so much for your perspective. We so appreciate you. Thank you, Giselle. As we head out to break, take a look at the beautiful vistas that we enjoy here in Southern California. This is a view from the Mulholland, Mulholland Scenic Overlook. Gorgeous start to your Thursday morning. Make it a great day, everyone. We'll be back.